Hello, American Prestige listeners. It's Derek, and I am very grateful to be joined uh, on relatively short notice uh, by Omar Shakir. You may remember Omar. We've had him on the program in the past. He is the Israel and Palestine director at Human Rights Watch uh, and uh, is understandably uh, pretty busy these days. And so uh, we were, were grateful and, and lucky to have him uh, join us again. Omar, thank you so much. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about conditions in Gaza as they stand, you know, as we're recording this on October 26th in general. But uh, the reason we, we reached out specifically was about the, uh, I, I think, canard that's been raised this week. I think everybody's gotten their new set of talking points or something a couple of days ago. And at the, at the top of the list was uh, th- throw doubt on the casualty figures that are coming out of Gaza. Can you uh, talk a little bit about where this comes from, this, uh, again, I'm going to prejudice this, this fake controversy, where it comes from, uh, and uh, what you, how you've seen it kind of manifest over the past couple of days? Sure. So let me start with the facts, then we'll get to, to your question. The facts are that um, Human Rights Watch have been documenting violence, hostilities in the occupied Palestinian territory for well over three decades. We've covered multiple rounds of hostilities in Gaza, and we have found the data on casualties from the Gaza Ministry of Interior to be generally reliable. When we've done our own independent investigations, um, those investigations have been largely consistent with the data from the ministry without any major deviations. Um, I would further note that there's a methodological reason for this because a government ministry has access to data from hospitals and from morgues, which is not possible for any other source to have. And we know that the reports of casualties that come from the ministry come from receiving directly from these uh, institutions and compiling together those reports. They include the names and details of individuals. The ministry just uh, recently published the list of those that have been killed in Gaza since um, October 7th. Um, I would further note that, um, you know, uh, the the ministry, uh, when it does these things, we look mostly at the overall number of casualties and the number of women and children. Um, you know, we uh, don't rely on that data for attribution because, you know, whether it's an Israeli airstrike or could it be another, you know, Palestinian misfired rocket, those kinds of details will do our own detailed investigation. But as an overall tally, um, that's, you know, a, a primary source. And I would add that we've been monitoring for the duration of hostilities. We've been looking at satellite imagery. We've been looking at airstrikes and the number of casualties that are being reported are within reason of the scale of bombardment, given that you have hundreds of airstrikes in a very densely populated area. These are around what you would expect, um, given the kind of devastation and the strikes that we've um, we've seen. So to, to get to your question, where is this coming from? I think it reflects a larger trend, which is the Israeli government and many of its allies in Europe and the United States for so long when it comes to Israel-Palestine refuse to recognize reality on the ground for what it is, and they prefer to just deny it or bury their head in the sand. So instead of dealing with the consequences of Israel's intense bombardment and the significant civilian harm caused, they would pretend to just, you know, pretend that that's not happening, right, to deny reality, just as they've done with the finding of Human Rights Watch and so many other human rights organizations that Israeli authorities are committing apartheid and other um, and other serious crimes, including persecution against uh, Palestinians. That provides a fog of misinformation and war that allows for this daily reality in which every day hundreds of Palestinians, including more than 100 Palestinians, are being killed, a reality in which today you have nearly half of Gaza's population whose home has been damaged or destroyed, the majority of the population who has been displaced, the entire population uh, you know, has had their water, electricity cut, fuel, humanitarian aid. So I think that's where it's coming from. Yeah, I think you you bring up a a great point in terms of the volume of of airstrikes that are taking place or air and artillery uh, strikes that are taking place in Gaza. And I think the uh, the talking point day, the day everybody got their notes to to start uh, questioning these statistics, uh, I think the health ministry released uh, its figures and said 
something like 700 people had been killed over uh, that previous 24 hours. And, you know, that was the trigger. Like, oh, you know, that's really high. What are they talking about? We can't believe this. And meanwhile, the Israeli military is openly saying we conducted 400 strikes on Gaza today, like just today. And it's sort of like, well, yeah, that's pretty much in line with what you would expect. If you're going to bombard this place that heavily, a place that is as densely populated as Gaza, like what are you expecting that these things uh, are going to do? Um, I want to it's the the main thrust of this is it's based on no evidence. It's based on no kind of uh, reference back to any instance that people can point to where the health ministry is obviously manufactured statistics. It's based on the concept of uh, it's the, the Gazan health ministry has Hamas cooties on it essentially it got hamas vibes and we can't trust them can you talk a little bit about uh, the health ministry itself or the the functioning of some of these uh operations in gaza and and how tightly i mean it's you know you would think from the way this is being talked about it's like two hamas guys in a room just making things up uh but it's not these are professionally run ministries can you talk about that yeah, I mean, look, I think the first thing to say is that there's been a, a tendency in so much of the commentary and even by political leaders to lump together different things. There is Hamas, which is a political movement and has a you know political arm. There is the armed wing of Hamas, which carried out the heinous uh, you know, attacks on October 7th, along with other policy and armed groups. And there's the governing authority in Gaza, which obviously is dominated by Hamas, but doesn't mean that every single person, especially bureaucrats, technocrats that work in these different departments are Hamas affiliated. I often analogize it to the situation in the West Bank, where Fatah is the main political party that dominates the scene. But that doesn't mean that every government employee or representative is a member of Fatah. So coming back to the situation in Gaza, right, you know, these reports, the way they're compiled is you have doctors and administrators at hospitals. You have professionals at the morgues that are keeping a tally of the people with ID numbers and other, bi- you know, ages, biographical information. They're central. They're providing centrally that that sort of information. And these are people who are professionals. They're doctors working under the most difficult circumstances. There are government bureaucrats. Sure, there may be some of them that, uh, you know, politically lean one way or the other. But we're talking about an entire government bureaucracy. People forget that Gaza is you know, an urban population, pretty well educated, you know, more than uh, 2.2 million people. And it's compiled there and it compiled in that way. The one other thing I want to say is um, if I, you know, if we were to give any credence to these reports, which I generally agree with you that, um, you know, they're disingenuous there, you know, I think what they did is point to the statement the hospital gave, the hospital gave the day of the attack um, uh, that day where they had a very high casualty number. Now, there is an important need to distinguish between statements issued by ministers in the minutes after something happens where they're estimating, projecting, and the kind of way that data is pulled together by the ministry in its periodic reporting. Now, to put those two things together is to make a very simple, uh, you know, but, but clear mistake in terms of like, you know, how, how statements are done. And I would challenge those that have made that equivalency to look at the figures from the Ministry of Health in Gaza. And it's quite clear that the number of that 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 the increase in casualties from the day before and after the Ahli strike show that whatever the estimate may have been, they were not entered into the cash casualty register until they had been gone to a morgue or hospital and their bodies had been processed. I want to talk about uh, the Ahli hospital strike, not in terms of trying to figure out what really happened, because I don't think we we know that or can know that. But in terms of what I think this obfuscation about casualties fits into contextually, which is a pattern of uh, the Israeli government, the Israeli military doing a thing and then immediately trying to throw smoke, trying to throw sand in people's eyes uh, and say, you know, this isn't what it looks like. You're you're not you know, you're not seeing. Uh, the real story. They've done this m- new, so many times, uh, it's hard to even keep track. But you can point to, for example, the Shireen Abu Akla killing, which, you know, instantly the, the response from the Israelis was, well, th- this was probably a Palestinian that did this. It wasn't us. And then it turns out, oops, it actually, it actually was an Israeli soldier. Um, it, you know, the, the Ahli hospital strikes me as the same thing. It, there's this initial uh, reaction that this is, this was an Israeli strike, which is, 
makes sense given the context, given that the Israeli military is bombarding this place. But immediately the there's this knee jerk effort to say, no, no, it was a Palestinian rocket that went off course. You don't know what you're looking at. Uh, it's not what it appears to be. And some a lot of that case has now been debunked. The recording that they released was a joke. Uh, the New York Times is, had just released a, a report this week saying, you know, some of the video that, they're po- that they pointed to as sort of evidence of this supposedly misfiring missile doesn't really make that case. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the pattern here of kind of, I, I think, just throwing chaff in the air? It's, it, it's, it almost seems like to, to confuse people until everybody moves on to the next thing. Yeah, I mean, I'll start by saying Human Rights Watch has not made a determination um, on, you know, the who is responsible for that Lahli strike. That's something that we're looking into. But yes, I mean, the Israeli government has a long track record of doing exactly that, of trying to evade responsibility in all sorts of different ways. And it goes back to where we started the conversation, creating a, a fog or a cloud of doubt or misinformation that allows that that, you know, forces journalists in the initial reporting states commenting in the early days to avoid sort of issuing clear pronouncements because there's at least been a claim made. And sometimes it's not possible in the minutes immediately after that to disprove, uh, you know, that claim because, you know, folks are investigators on on site. You don't have access to all the information. So we see this playbook often from the Israeli government. You mentioned Shreen Abu Akhla's case. There have been numerous other examples before where you start with a denial, you know, that, that you had anything to do with it. You, you put out another theory and then you start to see it walked back eventually to where eventually, you know, with Shireen's case, you had a situation where the Israeli government more or less said it's likely that we killed her, you know. Um, and so it doesn't always lead there. Shireen's case was unique and it's the high profile nature and the focus. In many cases, they just leave it at the initial statement. They never walk it back. Um, and certainly it's it's not credibly investigated. And even in cases where it's looked at, it almost never leads to um, indictments or findings of wrongdoing or accountability. Um, and as you noted with that strike, you know, there have already been elements of their narrative, regardless of what actually happened, which again, still we don't have a conclusive determination. It's clear that the initial, some of the initial information they put out there was inaccurate. And I think it, it, it reflects a much larger tendency um, of the Israeli government. So let's let's take a step back and look at the wider picture. Um, we're going to release this interview later tonight. So I think we can talk a little bit about it, the current circumstances without risking uh, that this will be overtaken by events. But where do things stand right now in terms of uh, the bombing campaign, in terms of uh, the casualty figures? What What is your latest information? Yeah, I mean, look, so in terms of bombing, we've seen an intensification of Israel's bombing in recent days. They signpost as much. The average number of Palestinians, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, being killed today, you know, w- was around 300. And now it's at a rate of around 700, which I think reflects more intense bombardment. The overall number of casualties, um, you know, now is exceeded, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, 7,000. So we're talking about, you know, um, you know, more than 2,000, well over two, 2,000 children being killed. Um, In addition to that, you know, the scale of bombardment, you obviously have a reality in which we again are going without electricity and water. Israel has cut both to Gaza's 2.2 million people. They're they're also blocking humanitarian aid and fuel from entering through its own crossings. Since October 21st, there has been some truckloads of goods coming in through Egypt, but it's been capped at about 20 a day. And you know, some cases, October 25th, there was eight trucks of aid that went through. And the UN has said even at, you know, at the rate of 20, that's about 4% of what used to go in before uh, the beginning of hostilities. And so you have a very desperate situation because of the cutting of, of um, aid and basic services. You have hospitals that are shutting down, winding down uh, their operations. You have family families without water, without food. So they're relying on the groundwater, which is largely unfit for human consumption. Um, you have people who, you know, are barely getting by food wise, drinking less water, eating less food than they should. Uh, people have lived again, have been living without electricity for, for, for days um, now, for, for a couple of weeks now. And then in terms of the, you know, the situation on the ground, you know, nearly half the population has had their home damaged or destroyed. Uh, 1.4 million people, according to the UN, are displaced. They have no safe place to go, nowhere to go. Of course, Israel ordered 
1.1 million in northern Gaza to leave their homes uh, back, uh, you know, back a couple of weeks ago. Many did leave, even though they had nowhere to go, and 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 um, and, and many of them have now been displaced again from the locations they've gone to because of uh, intense bombardment. There have been other orders issued. It's a, it is a um, unprecedented descent into darkness. We have not seen. Uh, levels of carnage or bloodshed at this level in the modern history of Israel-Palestine. And the concern is that the worst, it, as hard as it is to even fathom, may still be ahead of us. The Israeli government has made clear it holds the entire population of Gaza responsible for October 7th. And it has given indications that it intends to commit further mass atrocities. Um, so I think we're in a uh, really scary moment, that uh, a nightmare that has been going on for weeks and doesn't seem to end, have any end point. Can you give people a sense of just how far below what is necessary to even sustain a basic set of humanitarian conditions this, like, 20 trucks on a good day regimen is? I've seen the UN uh, talk about needing to bring in 100 truckloads of aid total per day that that strikes me almost as a political comp like a pre-compromise this is supposed to be palatable enough to the israelis that they would allow it i've seen oxfam which has accused the israeli government of using starvation as a weapon of war say that they needed like a hundred truckloads just of food per day to come in leaving leaving out you know fresh water uh medicine you know anything else that you you want to you might need to bring in to take care of people so can you sort of uh, give people a sense of just how inadequate to the to the moment uh, this level of relief is, which has been you know trumpeted by uh, the Biden administration among other people, is this great success? Yeah, I mean the starting point is people forget that eighty percent of the population before October seventh, before all the devastation we've talked about, relied on humanitarian aid. So when you cut humanitarian aid for you know multiple weeks. You can imagine what that means for the civilian, you know, for the population, right? So, um, you know, the, the effects are almost too much to compute, right? You have to almost break it up in different ways. Um, you know, medical care, right? We're seeing shortages of equipment, supplies, medications. You know, again, um, m many of the patients are children that, you know, are facing situations that are treatable, but may not be able because of the blocking of supplies to get in to be able to stitch a woman's head wound is one case we heard about uh, described, you know, we, we've heard about ventilate, you know, not having painkillers for surgeries. Um, we've talked about, you know, people not having anesthesia. We, we've talked about hospitals having to triage um, and only doing life saving surgeries. You can imagine what that means, for example, with for pregnant women, or others that may need other sorts of more routine um, health care that are not life saving, but aren't able to be uh, that are, it, aren't having their needs met with. You could imagine electricity, what the lack of electricity means, right? If you're a person with a disability who lives on the 25th floor and you can't use your elevator, it means you can't leave your house, you know, for days on end, right? You can imagine, for example, water, like what that means for an entire population when, you know, you're, you know, dehydration, but also it means, you know, we, and we've already started to hear cases of uh, dysentery and diarrhea and and other things caused by the water that's unfit for human consumptions. It's it's basically as you know you're you're signing a, a death warrant, uh, you know for 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 the entire civilian population. Just a matter of time if these if things continue the way they are. And the fact that the U.S. you know put all of its diplomatic weight, it says, to get twenty trucks in. Um, that's 2.2 million people. I mean, you know, you can think about your local grocery store. How many trucks does it need to fill a grocery store? And then imagine it in a situation that's been under closure for 16 years. It's been under this level of devastation. Um, and then 20 trucks a day. And by the way, only going to southern Gaza, not to um, other areas that, the, that, that Israel has ordered people to demolish. It's simply unfathomable. Let's maybe talk a little bit more about the situation in the hospitals. I, I think this is uh, something that's maybe particularly hard uh, for people to fathom. But the hospitals are, um, I think we understand when somebody says a hospital's over over capacity, especially uh, having lived through COVID, that's, that, that's sort of a thing that, that people can grasp. But 
the lack of fuel, the fact that there's, you know, there was only a few hours of electricity before this all per day before this all started. Now everything's running on generators. The fuel for the generators is running out. They can't bring more fuel in. This is people who are on ventilators, people who are on dialysis, babies in incubators, anybody who is hooked up to a machine or depends on a machine to save their lives or, or keep them alive is is in danger of dying. I mean, talk, you know, what's the scale of, of the the massacre that could be about to come just from from this one thing, this this uh, the fact that these hospitals are going to have to shut these things off. And they've, it's already started to happen. So we've already seen reports of hospitals shutting down, reducing operations. We've seen, we've heard horrific accounts from doctors who, because, you know, over capacity, you know, they get two patients, two kids, you know, and they have to decide who lives and who doesn't because they just simply with, with the scale of killing and carnage and with the restrictions and with, I mean, people forget that. Yes. So people in Gaza on average before October 7th were getting you know, half a day of electricity, right? The way that hospitals and other things function was generators. Generators require fuel. So fuel is really in many ways, some of the most urgent, even to get aid on trucks, you know, in Gaza, out to other parts of Gaza, you need fuel, right? To even distribute within Gaza, you need fuel. So the fuel crisis is in many ways, the most significant. Now, Israel says, well, you know, Hamas might, you know, divert Fuel, but the reality here is under international law, you ought, you you know you can monitor aid, but you cannot deliberately block uh, you know relief material necessary to the population to live. That's a war crime, you know. So Israel just outright blocking it is unlawful. The UN has much experience in other agencies providing aid, fuel, construction materials to Gaza, and you know doing so in a way in which there are constraints. Uh, that there are, uh, let's say, monitoring and oversight mechanisms. And so this is a new territory. Israel is using it as pretext to punish the civilian uh, population. Collective punishment is a war crime. To take a, a slight detour, can you um, give people sort of an update on how things stand in the West Bank, where violence has also been, certainly it's been been overwhelmed by the news from Gaza, but violence has also uh, been on the uptick in the West Bank, particularly Israeli security forces, settlers uh, targeting Palestinian civilians. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? Absolutely. I mean, I think the West Bank has fallen a little bit out of the headlines, but in many ways, we're continuing to see unprecedented violence. Now, I should start by saying in the West Bank, Already before October 7th, we were facing unprecedented levels of bloodshed and repression. So, for example, before October 7th, uh, Israel had killed more Palestinians in the West Bank since the UN began systematically reporting fatalities in 2005. Right. We've already seen in the period between October 7th and October 26th, a number of killings that's, you know, over 100 killed in the West Bank. And, uh, you know, the number for the first eight or nine months was, you know, near around 200. So that, that, that just shows you the, the, the degree to which these numbers are just massively increasing. Right. And, um, you know, they include children, they include, um, you know, video footage shows many cases that appear to be using lethal force in a situation where there's no imminent threat to life. Um, in addition, we've seen settler violence, you know, which is, again, was already at really high levels before October 7th. Uh, in many cases on steroids, right? I mean, we, we have we, already in 2020, 2023, we saw a number four entire communities, according to the UN, that were entirely displaced because of ongoing settler violence and the Israeli authorities failing to take action to hold perpetrators to account. Now the UN is reporting every day about additional families who are being displaced because of uh, rampant settler violence. Detentions and arrests. We've seen hundreds detained in the West Bank since October 7th. Let's remember, there's no Hamas in charge in the West Bank. So that pretext doesn't even apply. And again, we already had a situation before October 7th where we had a 30-year high in the number of Palestinians being held in administrative detention without trial or charge. And not only are we seeing the arrests in the West Bank, um, there are reports of hundreds, potentially even thousands of people in Gaza, including laborers that were working inside Israel who are missing. And there are reports, including by Israeli human rights organizations, that these folks are being detained under a form of administrative detention. So again, you start think, putting all these things together and you realize the scale 
of repression happening everywhere. And it's, it's, it's just, um, I can't, I don't have no other words to say unprecedented. We haven't seen it before. Uh, we've seen a lot of these abuses, probably all of them in some degree, but at a degree of intensity that we haven't seen before. Maybe we should, um, because we, we come, I think, I just have a couple more questions, but one of them uh, is, uh, what do you make of the U.S. role, the U.S. government's role in uh, enabling this? I know there's a lot of very speculative kind of attempts to absolve the Biden administration to say that, yes, they're embracing Israel publicly, but behind the scenes, they're actually working to to make things better. My my reaction every time I hear that is, what could they possibly be doing? Like, what could they possibly be averting uh, when you see what's going on here? And I wonder you know, what your your take is on that that argument. Sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? I want to make sure I understand it exactly correctly. I mean, it's just sort of my my reaction when I hear this idea that they're working behind the scenes and they've actually right, right. Sorry, restrained the Israelis. The it's like, what, restrain them from doing what? I mean, exactly. look at what's going on. Like, what are you actually stopping? So this isn't the time for behind the scenes diplomacy. We're facing the prospect of further large scale atrocities. The Israeli government is signaling their criminal intent to commit heinous atrocities. The time is now to speak loudly and unequivocally. I think the U.S. role has been abysmal. The reality here is the, you know, the world and the United States among them has had a clear position when it comes to Ukraine and other crises. They call for basic things, and that's all we're calling for here. Calling on parties to respect international humanitarian law. There's been some of that, but it also means calling out you know, war crimes when they're committed. It means calling for immediately basic services and aid to be rendered to populations that need it. It means calling for accountability for serious crimes. It means dealing with the larger uh, context and root causes that led us to have rounds of escalations, including Israel's apartheid against Palestinians, including its year-long crushing, crippling closure you know, of the, of the Gaza Strip, right? I think that, you know, the U.S. has not only failed to make those calls, you know, but is supplying weapons to the Israeli government at a time in which Israel is dropping explosive weapons with wide area effects in a densely populated area, causing significant civili civilian loss of life. So I think it is, it, it is um, imperative. It's not only for the interest of um, the United States. It's not only, sorry, I should say the interest of civilians in Israel-Palestine, but it's also in the interest of the United States because ultimately double standards further undermine a country's own credibility and it undermines the very international rules-based order that the United States wants to mobilize on so many other occasions. There's need now for urgent, immediate action to prevent further um, atrocities and uh, unlawful attacks. I want to get your take on some of the rhetoric that you've heard from uh, Israeli officials um, basically openly saying, uh, you know, conflating the entire population of Gaza with Hamas, talking quite explicitly about collective punishment, uh, and also from, from U.S. officials. And I think, you know, uh, there was one thing that, that really smacked me in the face this week, which was when the uh, spokesperson for the, the National Security Council in the White House, John Kirby, uh, said uh, amid growing international calls for a ceasefire to allow humanitarian relief and some some respite for the population, said a ceasefire right now would only benefit Hamas, which is just this like gobsmacking mask off, I think, you know, or mask slipping uh, moment where you admit that we don't really think about Palestinian civilians, except in the most abstract terms when we're uh, coached to say something like, of course, we preserve, you know, we want to preserve and protect Palestinian life, uh, you know. But it, when, when we're not consciously trying to, to uh, mouth the right words, we don't really, it's, it's like, you know, we don't consider them uh, uh, relevant. The, when you say something like a ceasefire would only benefit Hamas and ignore the 2.2 million people uh, who are taking the brunt of this. I, I just, sorry, that's a rant. But my question is, uh, you know, what, have, what do you make of some of the things that, that you've been hearing people say? No, I think it's, it's um, alarming. 
um, beyond alarming because it's not just the intent that they're stating, but it's the fact that they're taking actions consistent with that in the scale of devastation in Gaza, entire city blocks, large parts of neighborhoods reduced to rubble, entire families, you know, erased, um, you know, this scale of killing when it comes with statements from Israeli officials, by the way, across the political spectrum, who hold all of Gaza responsible, you know, for, for the attacks, who describe Palestinians and, Ga- you know, describe people as human animals, you know, that talk about cutting off all forms of aid, right? Until, you know, until, until people are defeated, right? Um, you know, and, 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 you know, Hamas or other people are defeated. I mean, this is like, you know, um, it, it, it really needs a serious and effective response because the Israeli government is signaling an intent to commit atrocities. They're committing acts that are killing civilians that are, you know, destroying uh, city blocks and, and high rise buildings and wiping out families. There needs to be a concerted international action. I think we're really, uh, you know, at a moment where history will look back at us and ask what we did. We're failing the test. I hope, I hope we can recover to, to, uh, you know, to, 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 you know, before it's too late. It might already be too late. I know your, your time is, is occupied. So I'm, I'm gonna, I, I don't want to keep you uh, much longer, but I, I know people, hear about this stuff and uh, they listen to this show they they've he- heard about it uh repeatedly over the last couple of weeks um and i'm sure that people want to know what they can do and we tend to be pessimistic about that question on here on american prestige uh just because all, all these decisions are are it seems so far removed from any public role or public input um, but as you, you know, as somebody who who works in this space in the the NGO uh, world and and tries to mobilize, uh, you know, people to 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 help to do something, what are some ways that uh, people might actually be able to contribute to helping the Gazan civilians or you know uh, exerting some pressure on the political system to to change what's going on or, or to stop what the worst of it that's yet to come. Uh, what, what can people do? I think the first thing is to raise your voice. I mean, everybody can do that. You can do it on social media. You can do it in your friend circles. You can do it in your uh, place of employment. We've seen many universities, companies issue very one-sided statements that fail to reflect the reality we're dealing with. I think there's a lot you can do to educate your colleagues, your you know classmates, your friends, your relatives, you know about that reality. Obviously, as any good American citizen, you should be calling your representatives, make sure they're aware uh, of your position. But ultimately, like in a situation like this, I always think the best action one can take is localized, because you know w- what's happening. The con- considerations by whether it's Hamas or Israel or the United States. Uh, even a congressperson, even you know somebody in, in the center of the action may not actually, someone in the administration, we've seen resignations of senior officials who, who feel they can't change the arc of the policy of the administration. But there are things that you can take uh, in your local uh, area. As I said, if your church, if your university, if your employer put out a one-side statement, push back share more resources, encourage there to be further, you know, conversation. If there is a way in which your company institution might be complicit in this, right? Maybe it's through your investments in a company that provides weapons. You know, I think you 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 can be clear about, you know, your, you not, in, not wanting your institution to be complicit in human rights abuse. So I think there are things that we can all take and local is better. You know, especially in a moment like this, where, you know, this discussion is happening at so many different places in so many different areas. I think focusing on that, doing your job due diligence where you can, if you have a platform through your representatives, but I think doing what you can in your community to at least recognize reality for what it is so people understand what we're facing, getting the facts out there, but also taking action. If there's things you can do to raise your voice you know, um, about what's happening, I think the demonstrations that have been happening have sent a loud message in different quarters. Um, if you can take action to uh, and, you know, have non-complicity. All those things matter. They don't go unnoticed. Omar Shakir, Human Rights Watch. Uh, thank you again for coming on the program. I wish I could say this will be the only time we talk to you about the atrocities in Gaza, but I suspect it will not be so, unfortunately. So uh, I do thank you for coming on and uh, we look forward to your your return. Thank you again. Yes. 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 Yes.